Welcome everyone to the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where we spend time chatting with expert gardening guests and we ask for their favorite tip. I'm Christy Wilhelmy, your host. For the month of July, we're sharing expert tips from our archives on a theme, the best of pest control. That's the theme for this episode. First up, Jessica Walliser. She is known as the bug lady and she has a lot of information to share about pests and how we can steward the good ones and take care of the bad ones. Let's listen in. What are some of your favorite beneficial insects and how do you like to attract them to your garden? Oh my gosh, that's a loaded question. I know, right it's Boy. huge. <laughs> yeah, it's like picking your favorite kid or whatever, you know. So, we can take it in uh, parts. <laughs> there you go. So I guess first, I think it would probably be really good for me to separate the two major groups of beneficial insects, right? So... Although every insect has a role in the ecosystem, so really when you think about it and from that point of view, all of them are beneficial, except maybe the ones that are imported here and, and be, have become invasive. Those right. don't count, right? But everybody else has a role in the ecosystem, right? So, But from a gardener's point of view, we're talking about insects being beneficial in one of two ways. The first is that they're a pollinator. Mm -hmm. Right, So we know we have 4,000 species of native bees in North America. We have 750 species of butterflies. We certainly know there's lots of beetles and wasps and flies that serve to pollinate as well. Mm -hmm. And then the other group of beneficials, which is really what my focus is, although I love the pollinators, but mine is really on the beneficial predatory insects. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. These are the bugs that do your dirty work. Yes. They're the ones that help you control the pests. And if you create a garden and a space where they can really thrive, you will be relying on pesticides uh, and, and you know physical traps and mechanical controls for pests a whole lot less often because you have like your own little built-in army working for you. Right. So that's what the focus of my books are on that group of beneficial insects. And those, I think, are, are the ones that I would like to focus on today because those are my favorite as well. Good. Kindred spirits. Yes. Uh, yes. F- like my favorite is the parasitic wasp because it pokes holes in aphids and lays its young inside it. <laughs> it's yeah, the best. Right? So what right. are some of your favorites? One- that's only one group of parasitic wasps, the, the, you know, the ones that, aphidious wasps, which use the aphids, you know, as hosts for their young. Uh-huh. But there are thousands of other species of parasitic wasps that use different species of insects to house and feed their developing young. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people are familiar with the tomato or tobacco hornworm mm-hmm. and how the cotija wasp lays one to 300 eggs in the back, just under the skin of that caterpillar. And then... The larval wasp spends its entire larval life stage inside the body of that hornworm. And then when it's ready to pupate, it kind of oozes out through the skin of the caterpillar and spins an external cocoon. And that's what we see sometimes those little white, like little grains of rice hanging off the back of those caterpillars. Right. That's the the wasp that is pupating into an adult and then will go off to fly and do it all over again. So I love the parasitic wasps as well. There's a bunch that do, you know, true bugs. Many of them actually are quite specialist, which is really interesting. It's like one species of wasp can only use one species of caterpillar to house and rear its developing young. So they've co-evolved together, and maybe that caterpillar only feeds on one or two species of plants. So we have this three-way partnership, right, between the plant, the what we perceive as a pest, which is really just a caterpillar, and then the parasitoid. And then there's other layers of it as well, because sometimes parasitic wasps have other insects that parasitize them. So it's kind of all this big connected web, and that's what's so cool for me about beneficial insects is how they're tied to everything else in the ecosystem of the garden. I just, it's really fascinating. I agree. Plant a diverse habitat. You know, uh, not everybody has the same shape mouth in the insect world. <laughs> all we humans have the same shape mouth. We have the same morphology, right? Insects do not. A ladybug mouth is different than a parasitic wasp mouth, which is different than a lacewing mouth, which is different than, you know, any other beneficial insect has a different mouth part. And because of that, for those species that rely at one point in their life cycle on pollen and nectar, they have to have a diversity of flower shapes to drink 
pollen and eat nectar from. So the greater diversity of plant species you can have in your landscape from the size, from the structure of the plant, from the bloom time to the bloom shape to the size of the flower, the more diversity you can have, the better. Um, if some plants are better than others for supporting beneficial insects, but the goal is to have as much diversity as possible. And do you have any favorites that you like to plant in your own garden? Well, I would say for, you know, for the parasitic wasps, for ladybugs, for lacewings, um, for like uh, the big-eyed bugs, which do drink pollen and nectar early in the spring when there's not a lot of, uh, you know, protein-based prey available for them. Mm -hmm. You know, those types of insects really love to have flowers with a shallow, exposed nectary because they don't have a long tongue or a deep proboscis like a butterfly would have. So they can't drink nectar from a tubular flower. Mm -hmm. So they want tiny flowers that are shallow and exposed nectaries. And number one fam plant family for that is the carrot family. Right. The, the ACA. Um, so, yes. Or, oh, 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 right, the umble yeah. family. So, yeah. Yes, yep, umble family, so the, the blooms, think of a dill flower or a Queen Anne's lace flower, right? It looks like an umbrella. It's got not one flower, but it's got thousands of tiny flowers clustered together in that inflorescence, and those types of flowers are perfect for these little beneficial insects. Great, and that's, that's a fantastic tip, but it is tip time, so I'm going to grill you for another one. Do you have a favorite tip that you'd like to share with the Garden Nerd audience? Oh my gosh, I have a billion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's go back to the beneficial bugs. Yes. Tip, if we could, okay. right? So you were asking me what things we can do in the garden to really promote beneficial insects. And I'd like to mention one more. Okay. And that is how to treat your garden in the fall. You know, traditionally we're taught to cut everything down, rake everything up, and put your garden to bed clean and pristine, when actually that's exactly the opposite of what pollinators and beneficial insects need. They need you to leave your garden be messy. Like stop treating it like your living room because it's not your living room. You need it, to, you need it, they need to have cover for the winter. They need to have hollow stems to hunker down in. They need to have debris and leaves sitting there um, for them to take shelter in for the winter. So stop doing a fall cleanup. Wait to clean up your garden until the following spring. Ideally when the temperatures have been in the 50s for at least a week, that's when it's your signal to go ahead and do your cleanup. That's a great tip, and I have a, an anecdote about that myself. When growing asparagus, there's controversy over to whether to prune back the, fall, the foliage in the fall or in the spring, and I leave my asparagus foliage over winter because my ladybug population mates in the asparagus foliage, and so we've got tons of ladybug larvae. You know, they look like alligators with college sweaters on, and they're hanging out in that foliage all winter long here because we don't get snow, so that's what's where things are actually kind of happy here in our garden. And then I cut the foliage down in spring, and the new asparagus starts to jump up. So I think that's a great tip. Yeah, and they're probably, those ladybug larvae are probably really helping you um, with the asparagus beetle larvae. Yeah. Um, so they get a, I must think you have those in California. Uh, I think they're coast to coast asparagus beetles, but they're going to help you get a jump start on things in the spring. And if you clean everything up in the fall, they're not going to be there in the spring anymore. Jessica Walliser is just a font of knowledge of when it comes to pests and the statistics around them. Now let's listen in to Susan Mulvihill and her expert tips for pest control too. Now, we talk about IPM a lot here at Garden Nerd, but for those who are just learning about this term, what is IPM and how do you utilize it in your garden? So IPM means integrated pest management, and it's a systematic approach for dealing with pest problems that come up and doing it in the most environmentally friendly way. And so the first step involves monitoring your garden on a regular basis. And you know, it's, it's not that hard. It doesn't take much time. And you just cruise through your garden and see if anything jumps out at you. You know, maybe the plants look a little wilty and you realize, oh, I should increase the amount of time they're getting watered. But maybe you'll see a bug. The first thing you need to do is identify it. That is crucial because there are so many beneficial insects in our gardens. And so you obviously don't want to kill something that is going to help you deal with pests. And so if you spot an insect, you want to keep an eye on it. Is it going to get worse? 
If it does, then you're going to need to decide what you're going to do about it. And in my book, I mention all sorts of organic methods and organic products you can use. And so I list all of them in the order of, you know, the the easiest and least impact to more significant impact, but everything is organic. And so once you've done that, it is so important to keep good notes so you can record how did that work? What worked better? What should I do differently the next time? And also, in regular IPM, the last method is to use a chemical insecticide. And I just can't bring myself to do that. So I, I skip that step. I do everything organically because it's so important. We all need to be good to the environment and careful what we're using out in the garden. One of my favorite things about IPM is learning about the the life cycle of certain insects. And I loved dis- dis- discovering what natural predators they have. And I, I know my habit is to try and find out what interrupts their life cycle and treat it on a biological level that way. Do you yes. have any favorite things that you like to do uh, in your own garden to manage pests? Oh, gosh. Well, the one of my favorite things to do is to use a floating row cover so it's a physical barrier to keep insects away from certain types of plants, especially ones that don't require um, pollination. But other things you can do is if you manage to wipe out one aspect of the life cycle, you're certainly interrupting that that whole life cycle of the insect and and it can resolve the problem. Now, we're lucky because we're in a very rural area, so I don't have a close neighbor that might have a problem with a certain type of pest. Um, so a lot of times, as long as I take care of the, the bug in our garden, a lot of times that can resolve the problem completely for me, which is nice. I realize that's the exception to the rule though. (laughs) Right. Especially in a community garden setting where we have, uh, we've got plots right up against one another. And if, if one person has cucumber beetle, pretty much everyone's going to have cucumber beetle that year. It's hard. Yeah. You know, we don't have those here. I, and we probably will at some point, but um, they are just nasty. They are. And well, we didn't have them until about four or five years ago. And when they showed up, you know, they're vectors of bacterial wilt and that's mm-hmm. how they're affecting my squash plants where I'll, they'll be perfectly fine one day and then wilted and sad and dead yeah. on the ground the next day. So, uh, do you have, I'm personally asking because I'm always trying to figure out how the heck to treat this, uh, w- without, you know, getting out the bug spray. Do you have any solutions that you recommend for cucumber beetles? Yes, there are actually all sorts of, there's a, a really long list in the book of controls you can use. So one thing that is good to do if your garden is large enough to allow this is to practice crop rotation mm-hmm. so that it can make it more difficult for the cucumber beetles to find the the their targeted crops, basically. There are some, uh, so cucurbits are things like, you know, cucumbers, melons, squash, pumpkins, that sort of thing. There are some varieties that are resistant to bacterial wilt and cucumber mosaic virus, so that kind of helps. Another thing is if you start your cucurbit plants indoors, You can let the seedlings become more vigorous before you transplant them outside, and so they can better withstand damage from the beetles. Oh, okay. And another thing is if you mulch heavily around whatever the plant is their host that's in your garden, you can prevent beetles from laying their eggs in in the soil. And so that's an example of what you were saying earlier of disrupting their life cycle. Yes, and that is that is a good thing. Mulch is always a good answer anyway for just keeping moisture in the soil and, and keeping weeds from growing. So you get so many multiple benefits out of that. Just that one thing. I know it's so simple. Of yeah. course, I say that because I don't have cucumber beetles, <laughs> but I, that's probably the very first thing I would do. 
I would say the two most annoying pests that we get in our garden are aphids, ugh, and uh, cabbage loopers. Those are probably the, the worst, I would say. And so for aphids, usually where I get them in my garden is on cabbage family crops. And since none of them need to be pollinated during the season, I can place a, a layer of floating row cover over the planting, and that acts as a physical barrier to keep the aphids out. And ironically, cabbage loopers and cabbage beetles, or excuse me, cabbage worms, also target the same crop. And so by putting floating row cover over the bed, as soon as I plant seeds or seedlings and leaving it over the whole season, it keeps those two insects, the aphids and the cabbage worms away from the plants. Yeah. I'm a big fan of floating row cover. It helps in so many ways for so many reasons. And, um, and, and it's relatively inexpensive and it's reusable from year to year. So I always recommend that as a first uh, line of defense, I guess, especially cabbage moths. We have those yeah, like crazy here. Mm. They're yeah. cute, but huh, no. <laughs> yes. And it, the, the floating row cover, it works so ideally. I don't use any other methods to deal with them. And, mm. you know, there's so many different kinds of beneficials that we have in our gardens, you know, even spiders. And I know a lot of people are terrified of spiders, but we have to realize when they're out in the garden, just let them do their thing because they are great predators and they take care of a lot of pests that none of us want to have in our gardens. You talk about having a quote unquote bug tolerance in the book. Sometimes we call that a tolerance for the ick factor right here. <laughs> uh, which is which is basically how many bugs you can tolerate before you get grossed out. So how can people calm their trigger finger <laughs> from reaching for the bug spray and develop their bug tolerance? Well, I think for one thing, we've been trained as a society that when we go to the grocery store, we want pristine produce. Right. You know, we don't want to see any holes in the leaves. And As far as I'm concerned, I mean, I don't want to eat bugs or anything, but (laughs) if there's a little bit of damage on what I'm harvesting, I just trim it off. You know, it's, it's really not that big a deal. But the other thing is I'm going to go back to the aphids because, uh, (laughs) apparently I have issues with them, (laughs) but Uh, You know, a few years ago, we were walking through the garden and we grow currants on bushes. Mm -hmm. And I saw a lot of puckered leaves one day and I thought, oh, aphids, I hate aphids. And then I thought, well, I need to do something about them, but I have to take care of this first. And then, of course, I completely forgot about them. I went out to the garden a few days later and I thought, oh, no, I got to check those poor plants. And the leaves were just covered with ladybugs and ladybug larvae, which look a lot different from the adult form. Mm -hmm. They look like kind of an orange and black crocodile, I guess I would say. They were having uh, the feast of their lives and there was no more aphid damage. So, you know, I think we do need to have some tolerance and a bit of patience to see if a problem will resolve naturally through the predators that are in the garden. And I know there are some insects where you see them, you got to jump right on it. But in a lot of instances, we should try to be patient and see if the beneficials will help us out. Right. If there's no food for the beneficials to eat, then they won't hang around. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you have so many clever solutions in your book, so I'm really happy that it is tip time. Do you have a favorite tip you'd like to share with the Garden Nerd audience? I do have one. I mentioned earlier about floating row cover, Mm -hmm. and for your listeners who aren't familiar with it, it's a lightweight fabric that lets both sunlight and moisture through it, but it also gives plants some frost protection early and late in the year. But I really love it for the reasons I mentioned earlier, that it's a physical barrier to keep the damaging bugs away from plants, especially plants that don't have to be pollinated. Mm -hmm. So things like the cabbage family crops that I mentioned earlier. Now, I always used to use floating row cover over those types of crops, but a few years ago, I switched to using bridal veil netting, which is also known as TULLE, T-U-L-L-E. 
And since cabbage family crops prefer cooler temperatures, the tool provides better air circulation than the floating row cover. So it keeps them a little bit cooler. And also you can see right through it so that you know what's going on with the plants without having to lift the cover. So you can find tool at fabric stores or online. I bought a bolt of it online two years ago so that I could get a really good price, and I now have a lifetime supply. <laughs> but the main thing is it's important to buy premium quality. That's how they describe it, and that's because the holes are smaller. Now, remember I said aphids are one of the pests for cabbage family crops. Well, aphids are tiny and they're sneaky, so you want to get something that has really small holes. And I do have to say that tool is a little on the fragile side, so you have to be gentle with it. But if you're careful, it should last two to three growing seasons. I'm really just using it over things like broccoli and cabbage, and it works great. I'm going to bring up another tip that I fell in love with and I can't wait to try. You have a trick for trapping cucumber beetles, since we were talking about cucumber beetles, that involves a yellow solo cup. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, this is such an easy project. And since you mentioned it, um, in the back of my book, well, in the third chapter, there are DIY projects for making your own traps or barriers, etc. And one of them is for a cucumber beetle trap. And the way it works is that, first of all, cucumber beetles are attracted to the color yellow, but they are really attracted to the scent of clove oil. And that's something you can buy very easily, mainly on the web. And so what you do is you attach one of those yellow plastic drinking cups to like a bamboo steak or something in your garden that is near your cucumber plants. And you put a little cotton pad in the bottom, drip a couple of drops of the clove oil, and they are attracted to that. So the important step for this trap is that you use a sticky substance on the outside and the inside of the cup because that's what they're going to get caught in. And it is so simple to make, very quick, and it's really effective. I'm definitely going to try it because I've I've really gotten so frustrated when as I mentioned earlier, the plants are doing so great and they're setting fruit and they're flowering like crazy. And then the next day they're just dead. I <laughs> put into oh. you know, like a month and a half of growing and then they just die. That's so awful. I, and I usually, you know, I'll go to the garden in the morning cause they're only inside the flowers, you know, during that time. And so I'll squeeze them, I'll kill them. I have no shame on saying <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to wear gloves. Now I'm so angry at them. I just do it barehanded, but, um, Basically, I'll, you know, find them inside the flowers, but they're yellow. So maybe they'll go to the cup instead. I'm so going to try this. I'm really excited <laughs> about it. I had almost forgotten about that great tip from Susan Mulvihill. Now let's listen to our last expert, Joe Lample, on what he has to say about pest control. You have your, ch your pest control chapter and you mentioned that just because it's organic doesn't mean it's safe. Let's talk about that. Let's break yeah. that down. <laughs> okay. Well, credit goes to Dr. Jeff Gilman, one of my good friends, and he's just he's been a great author and a great mentor to me. But something he said, he said it a few times in his books and in just our conversations, but he said, you know, because we have that conversation bantering around just because it's organic. And he said, you know, snake venom's organic, but they really want to drink it. <laughs> yes. There's a famous George Carlin, uh, there's a George Carlin bit where he says, dog poop is organic. <laughs> there you go. Say yeah, no more, right? Exactly. Right. Uh, right. But so for me, the big, the big ones that come up are uh, copper spray and neem oil. Mm. Both are safe for organic use. However, yeah, yeah, copper however. spray, it, it persists. If you apply too much of it, it, it builds up in soils and then it doesn't dissipate because it's a heavy metal. So what are your, what are your, what's on your radar for things yeah. that you don't like? Yeah, that's very true. Well, what, what I really um, want to make clear to people is, you know, when you opt for something that's organic for pest control, 
that 99% of the time that option that you pick doesn't know the difference between a good bug and a bad bug. You know, right. it's non-selective. It's, 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 um, efficacy is very high and it's broad spectrum, meaning that it's going to kill whatever it comes in contact with. So pyrethrum, for example, you know, from the chrysanthemum daisy, what could be wrong with that or what could be harmful with that? It's very darn effective in killing stuff, but there's a classic example of opting for something organic, but that doesn't, that doesn't do anything to help you save your beneficial insects out there. It's going to kill them too. Uh, and even insecticidal soap, which is approved oftentimes for organic control or uh, botanical oil or something like that, it smothers the pest or insect insect that it comes in contact with. And if it's a soft body pest, it's going to suffocate it. And so that you've got your lady beetle larva out there and all of the, you know, the lace wings or whatever, mm -hmm. you're not doing yourself any favors, nor are you doing your garden any favors or the biodiversity that you have that you're trying to, you know, promote. That's not helping. So I want people to understand that. And before they even reach for anything, stand back, observe, be patient. And, you know, if you have to reach for something, just reach for the bug. Once you identify that it's actually a pest and then knock it into a bottle of so a cup of soapy water or squish it or whatever you want to do. But the last thing I want you to do is even if it's organic broad spray, thinking that that's going to help because as another good friend of mine, uh, Suzanne Wainwright Evans, who's a fantastic entomologist told me one time years ago, she said, you know, the biggest way to increase your pest problem, do you know? And I said, what is it? And she said, just to spray pesticide because you're <laughs> killing, you're killing all the bugs, which means the good and the bad and the bad have such a resistance to it. They come back stronger before the beneficials are ever aired there to show up again. So now it's a free for all buffet from the pest with no predators to take them out. And your problem just gets worse. Right. Exactly. So moving on to diseases, uh, you share something in the book called the disease triangle made up of three points. Mm -hmm. What are those points and how do they influence us or rather how can we influence them or how do we influence them? Okay. So the diseases um, have their host specific. So it may be more than one, but let's just use the garden example. So we have the pathogen. So the three things are the pathogen, the conditions, the environmental conditions and the host. And all of those th three things have to come together for that pathogen to bloom or infect the plant and show itself. And until those three things come together, the pathogen may be there, the host may be there, but if one of the th three things is off, maybe the environmental conditions aren't there, it's, n it's not going to manifest itself. But then when it happens, that's when it happens. So um, if you adjust one of those three things and you know you can't necessarily prevent the pathogen from coming in but you could you know if you're tired of growing if you're tired of dealing with your tomato plants because they get the same diseases all the time you know maybe you take a break from growing tomatoes for a year maybe you find that there's a certain disease that keeps showing up and maybe you find out that it's from the soil and so if you just move the environment and change the where the tomato is growing into clean soil you may be able to short circuit that disease triangle and eliminate that problem in the future or temporarily at least. At so, least, yeah. yeah. And I think that the message in this, uh, in this triangle is really calming for people who are terrified of bugs. And I, I get people all the time are like, I found an aphid on my whatever. And it's like, it's okay. It's yeah. one little bug. It's okay. <laughs> and, you know, or a tiny little hole eaten in one of their leaves. And they're like, I have to throw the whole plant away. I'm like, no, no, it's not like that. So it, it really gives people a sense of what needs to be in place for that to happen and how you can shift it so that you don't have to deal with it as, as urgently as you think you do. Right. And, and yes. And I understand. I mean, I really have a heart for the beginning gardener and the, and the people that are trying to do better and they, they're so excited. You know, the enthusiasm is through the roof and then they, they want everything to be as good as they can make it. And, and they haven't been around the block enough times to know that they're not in control <laughs> and that pests and diseases will come. Yep. And it's not usually fatal, you know, like with, with pests, you can go out there and see 35 to 40% damage on your foliage and your plant still can photosynthesize and it can still do what it was 
programmed to do through its DNA. Mm -hmm. It may take a little bit longer and it may work a little bit harder and the output may not be as glorious as if it had perfect foliage, but that's not gardening. So what I'm trying to do through all the different ways that I can reach people is to help them understand that, hey, it's okay. You know, things are going to be all right and take it from me because I've, I've gone down that road a few times. <laughs> I've seen it. And like when I see that in my garden, I don't even, I don't think twice about it because I know that it's going to be okay. But you don't yet. But I want you to hear from me that it's okay, and and just chill, you know, in a nice way. It's okay. Yeah. I hope you've enjoyed these expert tips from Joe Lample, Susan Mulvihill, and Jessica Walliser in reverse order. That's it for this week. Consider becoming a Patreon subscriber to support all the free stuff that we do here at Garden Nerd. You will find links to these original podcasts on the show notes for this week on the Garden Nerd blog. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and uh, check out all the other stuff we have going on at Garden Nerd including, but not limited to, our own online pest control course, Creating a Healthy Garden. Registration is open anytime. You can learn on your own schedule. Check it out at GardenNerd.com. And you will find us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at GardenNerd1, on Facebook as GardenNerd.com, and of course, our Garden Nerd YouTube channel. Happy gardening!